Why am I showing you a picture of a nice lady here and her son? This is Barbara Kowalczyk. I know her. She will be coming to Singapore in a couple of weeks for a big meeting, food safety meeting we have. She's a, a risk uh, analyst and she will give a nice presentation, I think. I'm not showing the picture because of her. I'm showing the picture because of the, the son, Kevin, here. He's uh, two and a half years old. And why am I showing you a picture of him? I'm showing you his picture because he's dead. He only got to be two and a half years old because he ate a tainted burger and got E. coli 0157. That's a very dangerous E. coli. If it gets to your kidney, and it did that to him, your kidney will stop functioning and the doctor can do nothing. So you die, and it's not a nice death. It takes some time. Here it took 10, 11 days. I'm showing you that because sometimes when we talk about figures, numbers, 250, 2 million, it's like we forget that behind each of these figures there is actually lives. And many times there are kids, especially when we talk about food safety, water safety, microorganisms. It's a lot of kids that are affected. Now the the problem that I'm going to talk about now is a problem that would result in many more kids and grown-ups dying in the future that we cannot treat. Not only in relation to food or food safety, but in relation to all the microorganisms that we share between each other. So I'm talking about antibiotics. Antibiotics clearly was a blessing. They were invented 75 years ago, around 1940, the first one. Uh, everybody heard about this, that uh, penicillin was invented by, by Fleming, or, or discovered, I would say. And he found out that uh, penicillin would kill microorganisms, bacteria. So we've used that since then, and many, many millions of lives have been saved. Before that, in the pre-antibiotic era, era, you would die if you had an infection just from a scratch, or you have a sore throat, or something like that. After that, you could actually take penicillin or other antibiotics. We have maybe 30 different antibiotics now. And you will be cured. We can even have fantastic interventions in our bodies. You can cut out your heart and put in another one. You can only do that because we also give the patient antibiotic when the antibiotic works. Problem is, they don't always work. And the way we are using them will give us a problem in the future in relation to how it works. The problem is that in the center of a microorganism, we have DNA, just like in any of our cells, we have DNA. We have mutations in DNA. If bacteria are being uh, put into an environment with antibiotics, some of them will mutate. When they mutate, they will become resistant to the antibiotic, meaning suddenly they can live when the antibiotic is there. And that means that the resistant bacterium will fight back towards the antibiotic and suddenly the antibiotic doesn't work. Now this is a fantastic description um, of how that actually works. So this is a, a lab, uh, Kishonok from uh, Howard Medical School. Uh, they, they put up a big table with a medium there where you, ha where you can grow bacteria. And then they put different concentrations of antibiotics. So you can see in the ends they had no antibiotic and into the center they had 1,000 times the antibiotic that they were using in this case. What they did was that they would put bacteria into the zero part there. And when the bacteria starts growing there, you will see that the bacteria cannot go across the first line where you have the first concentration of antibiotics. So you see that the bacteria is coming here on each side. They stop when you have this limit where you have the first concentration of antibiotics. So here you see the first mutation that can actually grow in antibiotic. Then it grows on and you will have other mutations coming on. You can see them on both sides and they are moving towards the center. And then they meet the next limit and then they have to have new uh, changes in their DNA, new mutations, so that they can actually take the 10 times antibiotic and move on from there. Again, they stop at the net, next limit and move on from there. So you can see here, this actually took like 10, 12 days. Uh, 
to, to uh, film this, but you can see how all these populations of bacteria, they have the ability to have mutations, which means that suddenly they can actually live and thrive, even if you have antibiotic. Here you can see the different uh, mutations that happened and how they spread into the center. So this is a fantastic illustration of how mutations can actually make bacteria resistant to antibiotic, and that is happening every time we use antibiotic. So I'm talking about a problem that is real because we use antibiotic a lot, and it's a problem that is happening just now, and it's really actually a very big problem. I'll get back to how big it really is, but one of the uh, reasons I say that it's a big problem is that just last month, the UN General Assembly actually discussed antibiotic resistance. This is not something that happens every year. UN General Assembly is talking about big economical things. They normally do not talk about health. They leave that to small, minor organizations like the World Health Organization or things like that. And normally they believe that they can take care of it. But maybe in this case, they don't think that they are doing well. I don't know if that's the case. The UN General Assembly actually discussed this uh, just last, last month. So it is a big problem. It's realized by a lot of countries. Why is it big? 700,000 deaths every year from resistant anti, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. That's a lot of people. Uh, I can compare to maybe one of the biggest killers that we have is cancer. Cancer is around 7 million. So this is 10% of cancer that dies from resistant bacteria. Now, how would that compare to uh, what is happening in Singapore? If you compare there, it's 500 people every year dying in Singapore from resistant bacteria. Compare that to how many people die from uh, traffic accidents. That's around 150, so it's three times more than die from traffic accidents. So it's a really big, really significant problem. And what is even worse, if you uh, try to extrapolate the uh, development here in relation to that, if we don't do anything apart from what we're doing now, which is very little, then it will grow from 700,000. In 2050, it will be 10 million every year dying. 10 million. So that's more than die from cancer every year. Cancer was 7 to 8 million. This is 10 million from resistant bacteria in the world. So it's a huge problem. Now, where do we actually use the antibiotics? Because I said that um, whenever we use antibiotic, we also have the risk that we create resistant bacteria. So I would like you to vote on this. And before you vote, so the, the thing is, where do, we, where, where do we use most antibiotic? Is it for sick humans, sick animals? Before you vote, just to tell you that I'm a veterinarian. I think I said that. I'm from Scandinavia, not smart Scandinavia, that's Sweden. Not, not you. Yeah, you will laugh at that in the NCU with the with you, with the big guy there. Yeah. Okay. Not from the beautiful Scandinavia. That's Norway. But from happy Scandinavia. That's Denmark. <laughs> Denmark is the happiest because we pay the highest taxes. No. <laughs> we are the happiest because we have the most pigs. We have 30 million pigs in Denmark, 30 million, three zero. We only have five million people like Singapore, 30 million pigs. <laughs> so we must be happy. Now, you shouldn't let that uh, affect your voting now. So how many would vote that we most, uh, use most for the poor sick animals, the, the pigs in Denmark and so on? How many would vote for that, that we move? Okay, yeah, I have the figure. 435. Uh, how many would vote for sick humans that we use most for sick humans? Oh, I think actually that the animals are winning here. Maybe because we have so many pigs in Denmark, I don't know. But actually it's the same, it's around 15 to 25 percent of the total use of antibiotic is in sick animals and the same in sick humans. So what's wrong with the figures here? There's something wrong with the figures, I'm sure you can see that. The, you're university students, some of you. Yeah, there is something wrong. We are missing, we are missing a big part, which is 60 to 70% of what we are using in antibiotic in general. We actually use just to make healthy animals grow faster. 
60 to 70 percent of all the antibiotics. Somebody would say that, or we figured out here, somebody figured out, somebody who's good at that, not a veterinarian, that it's uh, more than uh, 63 tons globally, which corresponds to 10,000 African elephants. I don't know why we had to have African elephants here. If it, if it, was, it could also have been pigs, but then it would be many more, of course, you know, it's like a million Danish pigs or something like that. But it's a huge amount of antibiotic that we use just to make healthy animals grow faster, a little bit faster, actually. So sometimes people then say, yeah, but it's okay, we understand you use them for animals and for humans, but isn't it when you use it for humans that it's really bad in relation to creating resistance? Actually, it's not. So look at this picture here. You can see that when fluoroquinolone, which is one of these 30 different antibiotics, when it was approved in the US in uh, 1986, for the next 10 years, there was no resistance recorded, no resistance at all. For 10 years, they used it in many, many, many different people. Then they started using it in poultry, and immediately we saw resistance. Immediately after that, we saw resistance. So actually, for this antibiotic, it was worse to use it in animals than in humans in relation to whether it generated uh, antibiotic resistance. So it's not true that the worst is when we use it in animals. So what can we do about it? Because I'm talking doom and gloom and, uh, you know, this is a big problem and uh, the world is going to go under. No, it's not. We can do something about it. First thing is we need to know how much we use and where we use it, and most countries don't look for that at all at the moment. We need to use how much resistance we have, and most countries don't really look for that at all. Then we need to have regulation about how we use the antibiotics, and again, most countries don't have that regulation at the moment. And then we need to convince the medical doctors and the veterinarians who are distributing antibiotics that they should use less. And I say this also about veterinarians because in most countries, veterinarians, more than 50% of what they earn, they get by actually selling antibiotics. They are drug dealers. <laughs> uh, antibiotic dealers. 50% of their income. How easy is it going to be to convince the veterinarians that they should use less antibiotic when 50% of their income comes from there? How, what can you do about that? You can actually ban that. You can say veterinarians are not allowed to sell antibiotics. They're not allowed to deal drugs. And that has been done in some countries, especially in, in Scandinavia, but it's been done in a few countries, so it could be done anywhere. If you can do it in Denmark, you can do it everywhere. And then just everybody also have to consider that antibiotics shouldn't be used when we have a virus. So if we have common cold, that's a virus. Antibiotic doesn't work. Uh, and actually, we can get well many times without antibiotics. Last thing I'm going to tell you now is we also have new scientific ways of investigating this problem and something that could actually be used so that we might not get to these 10 million deaths every year. This is a, a new system that we're working on also here at the NCU in Singapore, together with uh, scientists, 300 scientists from more than 50 countries. So the idea is that when you have a patient, you can actually find out what is causing the disease in the patient by doing DNA sequencing. So the DNA we have in the middle of us, we also have in the middle of a bacterium. So you sequence that DNA. If you do that, you can put that to a database in the cloud that would have and that's our idea, would have all the DNA of all the microorganisms in the world, bacteria, viruses, everything. If you do that, you would immediately get the answer back. What, what does this DNA tell us? What's the name of the microorganism and how can you treat it? Because resistance is also in the genes. So you would be able to treat the patient in the right way and with the right antibiotic. At the same time, you would have a global surveillance system where you could follow resistant microorganisms and how they move, because they move with people and they move with animals and they move with food. And that would be a fantastic solution, a fantastic global machine that we're suggesting, maybe the most fantastic global machines in Google or something like that. So we suggest there are global solutions, but we need to work globally on them. We need to work between the countries, between scientists in the countries to actually do something like this, because when we have a global problem, we need to also look at global solutions. Thank you very much.